continue our today's session. Uh, and uh, next speaker is Valeria Telio uh, with the talk of limit theorems for some of independent indicators with application to current occupancy scheme. Uh, her supervisor is Alexander Exanov. Uh, please, Valeria. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, so, at first, I want to say that I am uh, glad to give talk here uh, again for the third time, and I am happy that every year I have something interesting to talk for you. And as it was announced, I will show you limit theorem for some of independent TD. And I will apply these theorems to Carlin's occupancy scheme. Uh, my talk is based from Roslov and my supervisor Alexander Xanov from Kiev. Uh, we start from assumptions on independent indicators. Uh, we denote those, um, we denote by A1, A2, and so on, independent families of events which live on a common probability space. And as promised, uh, we consider process which we denote by X which is equal to the sum of those indicators of events AK, which are independent. And uh, we assume following things about processes. Uh, at first, we assume that for each non-negative T, uh, this process at point T is finite almost surely. And moreover, we assume that the mean of this process, which we denote by B, is also finite. Uh, then we can derive from it that the variance of process, which we denote by A, uh, is not greater than mean B, which is finite, so variance is also finite. And actually, we can even show that all exponential moments of this process are also finite. Uh, let me emphasize for you that we denote here by B the mean of process X and by A the variance of process X. Uh, we use this notation during the so it is important to remember what denotes what. So the first theorem is central limit theorem. Uh, to, to have it, we need to assume only one thing, that the variance is divergent to infinity. Then the process X, centered by its mean and normalized by the square root of its variance, converges in distribution to standard normal random variable. Yes, to standard normal random variable. And it turns out uh, that central limit theorem is accompanied uh, with the convergence of exponential moments. So under the same assumption that variance is divergent to infinity, we have that the exponential moments of the same uh, fraction, which we considered previously, converge to exponential moments of standard, standard uh, normal random distribution, uh, which is equal to exponent in such power. Okay. And uh, this exponential moment convergence is quite uh, expected due to the previous central limit theorem. Now we pass to low iterated logarithm, and here we need to assume much more. So we have assumptions, and we split them into two different sets, assumptions A and assumption B. The reason behind it is we need assumptions A to guarantee that the upper limit will not exceed one. And assumptions B, we need to guarantee so the upper limit is exactly one. So assumptions B, we need to show that there is some subsequence along which this limit is exactly one. So we keep the assumption A1, that variance is divergent, and add the following assumptions. A2, A behaves at infinity like some non-decreasing function A0. Then we have assumption A3. Uh, we assume that there exists mu star such that mean B is uh, bounded by variance A to some power mu star. And since we have that variance is non greater than B, we have that this mu star will definitely be non less than one. And we consider mu, which is infimum over such mu stars for which this is relation holds. Let's look at some example. Uh, if mean is behaving like logarithm to the power 3 and variance is approximately logarithm to the power 2, then we have that uh, 
mu is three half for each power which is non less than three half min is bounded by variance to this power. Uh, excuse me, uh, can I have mm -hmm. a question? Do you know that for mu, uh, which is in FIMO, such mu star, we also have the same relation that BT is O capital from AT in power mu? Um, it is not obligated. Uh, so it can not hold for me. Okay. Uh, if mu is one, we need some additional assumptions on mean B and the rate of convergence of B over A. Uh, and among those assumptions, we have that there exists such an femur. Let's look at it more precisely. Uh, it says us that the ratio of uh, mean over variance is bounded by logarithm of variance to some power q star times some slowly varying function. And we assume that this infimum uh, is untamed. Uh, so let's look at the first. I have the mean is t logarithm t, variance in is t. Then we have the uh, situation about which uh, Andre asked us right now that uh, mu is equal to one, but it's not attained. So like for each mu bigger than one, uh, mean is bounded by variance to power than bigger than one, but for mu one, it doesn't hold. Uh, and if mu is one, uh, we try to calculate this q. Uh, we just rewrite here b over a, it is logarithm, and a of t is just t. So we need to find in femum of such q stars that logarithm is bounded by logarithm to some power q star. So like obviously this q star is equal to one, and this infimum is attained. And slowly varying function here is just constant one. So in this case, we need to guarantee that q, um, this infimum is indeed attained. Um, this assumption A3, it is technical assumption, and we need it to guarantee that um, series, which we have in the direct lemma, uh, is conver uh, convergent. So but we indeed need. Then assumption A4. Uh, we assume that for each k and s less than t, uh, the events a k of s are inside events a k of t. So in simple words, uh, those families of events a k, we can say that they are non-decreasing. Uh, non in particular, it means that mean b is a function. And the assumption A5 is complicated, but there is very nice sufficient condition for it that mean B is eventually strictly increasing and eventually continuous. Uh, in general, for assumption A5, it is not required. Uh, if your mean is not strictly increasing or is not eventually continuous, you can just look at our paper and try to check this condition A5 for your process. Okay, and now we can pass to set assumptions, uh, to set of assumptions B. Uh, I recall you that mu star was defined in such way that it is in such uh, stars that mean is bounded by variance to the power mu star. And we have condition B1 here uh, that variance is eventually continuous, or if it is not, you have the second option uh, depending on the regime which you have. If equal to one, you need to check the ratio of such logarithm. And if mu is bigger than one, you need to check that the ratio of variances at such points tends to one. Uh, this condition B1 uh, is also technical and we need it almost for the same purpose as A3. We need it also for borel cantelli lemma, just we need it for the converse part of this to guarantee that the series which we have is divergent. And uh, the last assumption, which we have, would be two. And in order to show it, I need at first to define sequence to n. So assume in A1 that variance is divergent to infinity, pick any positive gamma, and depending on the regime, when mu is bigger than one or mu is equal, than, uh, equal to one, tau n is defined in a little bit different way. In general, it is in FIMO or such t that variance is bigger, and in every case, like it is bigger for function uh, which is specific for uh, here 
I recall you that mu we have here, gamma is just positive number, uh, and q we defined previously in assumption A3. Uh, now we are ready to formulate assumptions B21 and B22. Uh, let me explain. Uh, we have general assumption B2, but we suggest you two variants of this assumption, B21 or B22. B21 covers more possible cases, but it is more complicated, and B22 covers less cases, but it is simpler. Therefore, I suggest you to look at both of them. Uh, at first, we start from B21. Uh, for sufficiently large positive t, and for each positive zeta, we denote by R zeta of t a set of positive integers which satisfy two conditions. The first is that for each positive zeta and each positive gamma, there exists such number uh, from which uh, sets R zeta at moments tau and zero, tau and zero plus one, start to become disjoint. And the second condition is that variance calculated only over indicators from this set R zeta of t um, behaves like one minus zeta of the whole variance. Uh, let me discuss a little bit those assumptions. Uh, first assumption we need to guarantee uh, in the end uh, that we use the converse part of borel cantelli lemma for independent events. Uh, so the fact that those sets are disjoint will guarantee us that we have independent events. And the second assumption can be understood as follows, that uh, variance, like that this set of indices R zeta of t gives you almost the whole variance except of small, some small part zeta. So if zeta is close to zero, you can imagine that the main mass which we have in the variance is concentrated exactly on this set R zeta of t. And the second assumption is similar to B21. Uh, so instead of assuming B21 for every positive zeta, we just assume it for zeta equal zero. And in such case, we have here that variance over this set R zeta of t is exactly uh, at infinity the whole variance. So the whole mass of variance is concentrated on this set R0 of t. And after telling you all of these assumptions, finally we are ready to formulate the law of iterated logarithm. Let me recall you that mu was defined in such way, and if mu was equal to 1, we also uh, had parameter q, which was such in FIMO. Uh, so our main theorem is, assuming all assumptions which I named you previously, and recalling that you don't need to check both depending on the regime when mu is equal to one or mu is bigger than one, that the upper limit of process x centered by its mean and normalized by the specific function for each regime it is different is equal to one. Let's look for a regime when mu is equal to one. This specific function here has constant q plus 1. And we, here we also have iterated logarithm. When mu is bigger than 1, uh, this constant is changed now to mu minus 1. And pay attention, here we have iterated logarithm, but just single logarithm. And uh, we also proved the same about lower limits, just we proved that lower limits are minus 1. So it is classical form of law of iterated logarithm. And now let me show you how this law of iterated logarithm can be applied to infinite occupancy scheme. And let me... But, uh, before you start, uh, let me ask you, uh, uh, you said uh, classical uh, uh, iterated logarithm, but uh, in classical iterated logarithm, uh, we have some uh, relationship between the values of process at different points of the time. Yes, it is like uh, independent stationary increments or uh, something like this. That the upper limit is one and lower limit is minus yeah, one. Because it seems that you uh, just um, construct such a condition that you uh, uh, already fix, for example, uh, the intervals uh, where you can uh, you can manage the behavior of the process uh, by the, your condition. 
Yeah, so you put uh, a lot of uh, conditions in order to get such such uh, such, such results. So, uh, uh, an example, yes. Uh, example of what? Uh, of uh, the process, uh, the families of events, which satisfy such conditions. Yeah. Ah, okay. Here is going to be example. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, actually, it is uh, uh, my my, uh, my opinion that uh, uh, it is uh, different from the classical law of iterated logarithm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. okay. I believe let's, that let's this see. formulation about classic form like was a little bit unfortunate because I just meant that the upper limit is one, lower limit is minus okay. one, and uh, mm -hmm. I didn't think that it can mean also something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now we will see example uh, of uh, how we can use this law of iterated logarithm to some particular uh, set of events. And this set of events will concern infinite occupancy scheme. So I will start talking about it. Uh, we have an infinite boxes with numbers one, two, and so on. And we throw balls into these boxes is probability p1 of hidden box 1, p2 of hidden box 2, and so on. And here, pk is a discrete probability distribution. And we throw those balls into boxes independently of each other. Let's look at one of possible realizations of this scheme. At time 0, there are no balls, so all boxes are empty. Then at time 1, the first ball arrives and falls, for example, into the box 100. At time two, the second ball arrives and falls, for instance, into the box number two, and we continue this process infinitely, uh, infinitely yes. And we can see the infinite occupancy scheme with n balls. We consider characteristic k of i. It is the number of box if i here is equal to one, we just have the number of occupied boxes. Let's calculate those characteristics for some particular example. Here we write everywhere index five because we have five uh, balls at this particular moment in the scheme. And the number of occupied boxes is equal to three. They have numbers two, three, and 100. The number of boxes which have at least two balls is equal to two. They have numbers two and 100. And the number of boxes which has which have at least three balls or more, it is equal to zero because we do not have such boxes. This version of the scheme is called deterministic, and there exists another version of the scheme which is called Poissonese. Uh, let's take closer look at it. Uh, we denote by pi of t a Poisson process on the negative half line of unit intensity, and we denote by s1, s2, and so on its arrival times. So pi of t is the number of such k's that sk does not exceed t. Uh, in the Poissonized version of the scheme, we change the moments when we throw balls into the boxes. The nth ball now is thrown at time Sn, so at time t we have pi of t balls thrown. Uh, in comparison, in the deterministic version, ball was thrown at time n, so at time t we had integer part of t balls thrown. Uh, what this change of, of uh, throwing times gives to us. Let's denote by pk of t the number of balls which fall into the case box in the Poissonized version of the scheme. By the same property of Poisson process, those sub processes, pi 1 of t, pi 2 of t, and so on, depend on Poisson process of intensities p1, 2, and so on. So, uh, due to into different boxes are independent. Meanwhile, in the deterministic version, they are dependent. That's why uh, the common approach, which is used for solving problems for infinite occupancy scheme, uh, is at first, scheme is Poissonized. Then we solve problem for Poissonized version of the scheme. And then we depoissonize, because it is much easier to work with uh, something which is independent than with, than with something which is dependent. And we used exactly the same approach in our law of iterated logarithm uh, for uh, 
infinite occupancy scheme. I will show you it only for the deterministic version, but the kitchen behind it was that we at first proved this law of iterated logarithm for the personalized version of the scheme, because at this moment we had the sum of independent indicators. This infinite occupancy scheme was investigated by a lot of contributors. You can read uh, about the most important result of 2007 in survey by Canadian Henton and Pittman. Uh, also, in 1989, Dutko proved a one-dimensional central limit theorem for the number of occupied boxes, which can be derived using the same technique from central limit theorem, which I showed you previously. And uh, in 1967, uh, Carlin uh, wrote uh, his uh, uh, meaningful paper. Uh, therefore, this uh, scheme sometimes also is called uh, Carlin's occupancy scheme. Uh, what he did, he found out uh, that the scheme has different behavior for different probability distributions, which I'm going to call regimes. And we will take more precise look at it right now. So denote by PK of T, discrete probability distribution, according to which uh, you distribute poles between boxes. And uh, it, sometimes it is more convenient to work with uh, some functions, not with uh, sequences. Therefore, we which is defined as follows, and this counting function holds inside all properties of this probability distribution. If you take a look of, at behavior of this counting function, when x tends to infinity, it should also tend to infinity. And also, Carlin proved that it, it, it tends to infinity, but it tends not faster than just x. So the common assumption on this counting function, rho, also called as Carlin's assumption, it is that the counting function rho behaves like some x to the power alpha times some slow the varying function at infinity n. And due to these properties, the rho should be diverging into infinity, alpha should be non less than zero, and since rho uh, is diverging to infinity, but not faster than x, alpha is non greater than one. Uh, therefore, we also prove our loss of iterated logarithms uh, for these values of parameters from alpha, alpha from zero to one. And Carlin was the first to reveal that this scheme has different properties when alpha is zero, when alpha is from zero to one, and when alpha is one. And we also deal with law of iterated logarithm uh, in different regimes because the results will differ a little bit. Uh, when we have alpha is equal to one, uh, unfortunately, we didn't manage to cover all the cases, but we prove it for some subclass when alpha is equal to one, uh, to zero. Uh, this subclass is called the Hern class. Uh, a function belongs to the Hern class if we're all positive numbers and some slow the varying at infinity function L we have such limit relation. And the simple example of such function is just a logarithm, because in the denominator, you will have just logarithm lambda. So your function in the denominator can be just constant one, and you got this limit. This pi is slowly varying. So this pi is a slowly varying function. And working with slowly varying function, which is not from this the hand class pi, uh, it is challenging task because we don't know methodics of variance of number of occupied boxes. And our result is as follows. Uh, we assume that counting function rho belongs to the hand class pi with auxiliary function L. And we suggest you two different behaviors uh, of this function L. First is if it behaves like logarithm to some power beta times some slowly varying function. Here, beta is positive. Then we proved that the upper limit of number of boxes, which contain at least j balls, centered by its mean and normalized by its such function, uh, is equal to this value almost surely. Notice here that we have here single logarithm. And if uh, the second behavior we, which we suggest you is that L behaves like this exponent. Then we prove that the same ratio has upper limit, which is equal to this value almost surely. Uh, 
uh, the second regime when alpha is from zero to one, we cover it completely. So we assume that counting function behaves like e to the power alpha times some slow varying function L and alpha from zero to one. Then we prove considered previously has upper limit square root of two almost sure. And the third regime when alpha is equal to one. Here we need to split it two cases. Uh, when j is uh, when j is equal to one, when j is uh, greater or equal than two, um, in this the latter case uh, we covered it completely. So we assume that rho uh, is uh, behaving asymptotically as t times l. Uh, then we proved that for each j which is not less than two, and when uh, j is equal to one, uh, we didn't make to prove the converse part uh, that there is some subsequence along which uh, the limit is equal to one uh, in general we needed to have some additional assumptions i'll show you them now uh, we define function l hat as such integral uh, one can prove that this l hat is finite for big enough t and also since l is positive this function is uh, non-increasing uh, so, a uh, part of the theorem for j equal to 1. Uh, if the is known, the each small gamma, uh, the ratio of L heads at such moments is equal to 0, we have the upper limit of number of occupied boxes centered by its mean and normalized by function is equal to square root of 2 almost surely. And if this assumption 1 does not hold, then our proof gives only limit does not exceed square root of 2, but we can guarantee that it will be exactly square root of 2. And let me talk a little bit about this assumption. At first, I want to uh, mention that uh, there is such function L hat for each it holds. For example, this. It just requires a little and accuracy to check. And the last thing which I want to say is that we need this assumption uh, to guarantee the, the set of indices which we have in the converse part of Borel Cantelli lemma is going to be disjoint. So this assumption is again only technical assumption. And I want to finish my talk on this. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, as I said, you really have additional structure for this Kn. Uh, Kn is a randomly increasing process. And uh, let me ask you, do you know in the literature, or maybe you have some uh, results about the uh, weak convergence of Kn as a normalized process to some uh, known process like uh, some uh, subordinator and so on? with subordinators, so I cannot say you this, but I can say that this process, uh, Kn, uh, was investigated uh, under such types of limit theorems as like central mm -hmm. limit theorem, uh, and also we, there is functional limit theorem, but we didn't find law operated logarithm, that's why we got interested. Yes, uh, I see, I see, but uh, mm -hmm. this is additional structure which I asked it for, you just uh, proposed Okay, thank you very much. And uh, maybe some short questions or comments, please. Okay, so uh, uh, okay. I, I just want to, to, to give one short comment. Uh, the range of applicability of this law of the iterated logarithm is actually much wider. It's not only applies, it doesn't only apply to uh, Carlin occupancy scheme, uh, also in the paper we are going to submit soon. It has been successfully applied to a more complicated model, but and uh, of course we have more example in mind. So I cannot say that uh, the, con the conditions of our theorem are too restrictive. Okay, uh, not, uh, I'm not claiming that they are too restrictive, but uh, uh, to check this condition and uh, uh, in real examples, as I think, uh, you always have some relationship between these events and the different T, uh, like here. 
uh, you uh, exactly have some increasing process uh, and uh, even you can control how it in in increases. Mm -hmm. So maybe the same happened in another example. Yeah? Yeah, 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 but the, the, this is our, our basic assumption in the theorem that was presented by Valeria. And actually, at the moment, we are now working on uh, on simplifying this or discarding this condition. Now we, we want to, to, to we want to investigate what's happening when uh, these events are no longer nested, are no longer. Yeah, yeah. So, but this is work in progress, and uh, okay. I'm not prepared. Okay. Uh, now we have uh, to go to next talk, and uh, next speaker is uh, uh, Jin Gong from University of Minnesota. Uh, his supervisor is uh, Please. All right. Um, okay. So I shall um, take over. Um, mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Well, well, it's morning in America. Um, probably afternoon in Kiev. Um, so let me just share my screen. Um, the talk, um, the title of my talk today is um, uh, can, uh, can everyone see my screen? Um, yes, uh, it's good. Perfect. Um, so um, uh, today, my talk is about uh, majority vote processes with unbalanced noise on graphs. Um, so this is also part of my uh, thesis project. Um, okay, um, so let's start with some warm up. Um, so the majority vote process um, is an um, interacting particle system. Um, it's a, a continuous time Markov process defined on graph G. Um, so um, in today's talk, we'll just assume graph G to be um, of bounded degree, which means uh, the number of uh, vertices that's adjacent to a given vertex uh, is um, uh, bounded by a constant K. Mm -hmm. And um, some terminology, um, every vertex, we shall just call it a site. Uh, and um, we assume that at every non-active time, uh, every site, uh, has a state either to be zero or one. And um, for intuitional uh, purposes, uh, you might just view the state as opinion, like for example, your attitude towards a certain uh, thing. Um, and therefore the state space for um, this Markov process would be uh, the power set uh, equipped with a product topology, of course. Uh, and um, next we introduce its um, dynamics. Um, so um, we place different exponential clock of rate one at each side independently. Um, and uh, whenever uh, an exponential clock rings, um, um, then um, this uh, specific side X uh, with uh, the time of that clock T, uh, we shall call it an event point, and then we'll update um, the opinion of that side um, at this event point. Um, so um, there are two types of event points. Um, one is called noise point, uh, another is called vote point, and uh, each of them um, have different probability. So it has epsilon probability to be a noise point. It has one minus epsilon probability to be a vote point. Um, of course, um, um, this will be independent with um, other event points as well. Um, so all of the um, all of the above are um, pretty standard in uh, the context of interacting particle system. Um, so next we introduce um, um, the updating rule for our majority vote processes. Um, so at a noise point, um, the opinion of a site will be determined by uh, a, a coin tossing. Um, so in this case, um, we consider both the case of uh, fair coin and unfair coin. Um, so it has like a probability here, a sign of opinion zero uh, for a noise point and the probability P1 to assign opinion one, um, um, uh, to, to, to assign opinion one to the side X. Uh, and in particular, we see this majority vote processes is of balanced noise. Um, if 
here equals P1. Otherwise, it is all fan violence noise. Um, so those are just terminology. And um, of course, it's called majority vote process. So it has to involve a majority vote as well. Um, so that's when um, uh, if um, an event point is a vote point, uh, then uh, the opinion of the side act will be updated to be uh, the uh, majority opinion among its voting neighborhood. Um, so this voting neighborhood, V of X, uh, is a pre-assigned set for every site. Um, and um, we also consider the case uh, if there are uh, if there is a tie vote. Um, so if there is a tie vote, we'll just uh, let the opinion to remain unchanged. Um, so to sum up, uh, the basic setup for the majority vote processes is we have a site, uh, we have a, a graph G, and every vertex uh, in that graph has opinion, and opinion is updated with time. Um, and then um, um, and then there will be exponential waiting time for every site um, to be updated. And um, if their exponential clock rings, um, first we'll determine whether this will be a noise event or a vote event. If it's a vote event, it will be updated to the majority. If it's a noise event, then um, the opinion will be determined by a, a coin tossing. Um, so that's the basic setup. Um, is there any question? Uh, um, uh, so, uh, uh, in contrast with a usual, uh, for example, easing model or voting model, you have additional noise. So, we have two, two mechanisms now, uh, not only changing opinion relatively uh, based on voting neighborhood, but also we have additional noise with, uh, which calls uh, uh, so, uh, maybe some... Um, uh, delay in the symptotic behavior, I think. It, exactly. You, you, you are spot on. Um, so um, I'm glad you the process. Um, so a majority vote process has, um, it shares something in common with easing process. Of course, you point out um, we have this uh, noise uh, that's coming in at a constant rate. Um, so that easing doesn't have. Um, um, but 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 right like like um um if you consider the easing process at zero temperature then that easing process will be a um a majority vote in most cases unless a tie vote right um so um yeah yes um you're right like it shares some characteristic with easing um mm -hmm. and um a lot of the um um a lot of our result also shows. Um, the similarity in terms of behavior, um, uh, like with easing process, um, um, with stochastic easing process, uh, we'll mm -hmm. also mention that, um, um, soon after. Thank you. Um, that that's a really good question. Okay. Um. So now, um. Um. In terms of uh the main problems we want to consider um with our majority vote processes, um. So of course it's a um. It's an interacting particle system. Um, just like every interacting particle system, we want to uh, study its long-term beha long behavior. Uh, in particular, we want to develop limiting theorems if possible. And the, the most important thing, um, the most important preliminary um, to obtain limiting theory, um, um, find the class of invariant measures for our process. Um, so that's uh, going to be the like the first uh, of analogy. We call that a particle system is called ergodic uh, if it converges to a unique equilibrium starting from any initial distribution. Um, so initial distribution can be deterministic. It can be like an all zero or one configuration, um, or it can also be um, a random. And is your graph uh, finite or infinite? Um, it's gonna be an infinite graph. Um, however, our result do applies to finite graph. But finite graph, it's gonna be a yeah. trivial because it's yeah, uh, sure. a, a finite state Markov process. Um, but but yeah, right. Um, the, the graph is gonna be finite, and also we're gonna assume uh the graph has um a uniform bounded degree. 
Um, so that's the two assumption we impose on the graph. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Um, um, so, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I missed click. Um, so, so if um, if our um, if the class of environment measures contains more than one, um, then of course we'll also want to determine uh, the domain of attraction and uh, the rate of convergence to the best um, um, to, to the best level we can reach. Um, and also for this particular um, um, a model for this particular process, uh, the majority of both processes. Um, because it has two, um, two parameters. One parameter is the noise, like how, um, uh, like the probability for an event point to be a noise. So then that, that parameter we call it noise parameter, uh, and also at a noise point, um, at a noise event, um, there is a uh, error distribution. Um, so the probability of uh, a for a noise point to be zero or the probability for a noise point to be one. play um, in um, uh, long-time behavior in limiting theorem. Uh, in particular, we're interested in whether uh, there's going to be some phase transition. OK, <clears throat> um, so um, let's um, take the, the first component, the, um, the noise parameter first. Um, um, and uh, uh, G is, uh, we assume it to be uh, of bounded degree. And also for the voting neighborhood, we assume it to be uh, uniformly bounded. Uh, the voting neighborhood, typically people just take it to be all the all its neighbors. Um, so uh, our result later uh, actually include that case. <laughs> um, and um, so, so it turns out that um, when, when the noise parameter epsilon is large enough, um, then you could imagine the noise will pretty much be like dominating the system. Um, so uh, if we're talking in terms of intuition, uh, because whenever a noise occurs, um, the opinion of that side will just be updated to be um, uh, uh, according to a, a, a coin tossing, right? Um, so basically at every noise point, you just toss your coin and then determine whether um, the side has opinion zero or one. Um, so that um, in some sense, um, because it's completely irrelevant of its history. So in some sense, we can view a noise event um, as uh, intuitively as like, we just erase the history of a site. Um, so it like, like, like so, so we can imagine um, if we have a really large uh, epsilon, which means a large, a big, uh, a big probability for event points to be noise. Um, and um, it's a classical result from um, like the theory of Markov process. Um, like whenever that occurs, um, if you like, um, if the process like forget its history, um, then um, the Markov process is going to be um, strongly mixing. I uh, strongly mixing in um, um, for interacting particle system implies ergodicity. Uh, um, but uh, uh, yes. in this case, uh, do we know this invariant measure? It is uh, is it equal to the product measure related uh, just to in cosic at every uh, uh, vertex or not? Um, no, it, it's not going to be the product measure. Um, mm -hmm. So that, still uh, that, some a, connection remains. Uh, some some connection remains. Yeah. Um. Right. Yeah. Yes. Like. Like. For example. Um. And uh, claim is about correlation because of this, um, noise. So the correlation, of course, you can imagine it to be bounded by. Um, something like one minus epsilon, one minus epsilon square, some terms like that. Mm -hmm. um, but as long as there are still majority vote, the environment measure is not going to be the product measure. So that's, okay. um, I, I understand it's counter intuition, um, um, but mm -hmm. be because of the existence of um, 
the majority vote. Like even though noise is dominating, but that's not enough to okay I see. Make everything independent. Um, but it's gonna look pretty similar to independent. Like if your mm -hmm. noise is really large. Mm -hmm. Um. So um. And um, in that um um in that regime um. Um, the majority vote process will converge exponentially. It will also converge exponentially quickly, exponentially fast to uh, the um, any district uh, initial distribution. Um, so this regime, um, we should just call it um, um, the high temperature regime. Um, so the terminology, of course, we inherited it from a Ethan process um, because. Uh, the noise, um, the noise parameter epsilon in majority vote processes, in some sense, play the similar role as of the temperature, uh, in uh, easing process. Um, and um, the other end, uh, if when when epsilon is small, the low temperature regime, it's gonna be much trickier to study. That's also gonna be a focus of today. Um, okay. Um, so um, some um, related work, uh, previous work on majority vote processes. Um, um, the simplest case, if we consider the graph to be just, uh, the integer, um, the integer x is z, um, with nearest neighbor interaction. So the voting neighborhood is going to be a, a, a x minus one x plus one. Um, and then um, when epsilon is greater than zero, the majority vote process on D is gonna be ergodic. Um, so regardless of balance or unbalance, it's always gonna be ergodic as long as you have a positive noise. Um, um, so this is actually a, a special case, um, um, a direct corollary um, from Larry Gray's uh, result in 82. Uh, where he proved every monotonic spin system on Z with nearest neighbor interaction at strictly positive rate is ergodic. Um, so let me just spend a, a little time uh, explaining the terminology here. Um, so monotonics just means um, um, that just means if you have more zero um, um, locally, then um, um, then this um, local structure will tend to have more zero. Um, so you can like imagine that you can just um, um, intuitively imagine this as ferromagnetic. Um, that's pretty similar terminology. Um, strictly positive rate refers to um, like nothing is gonna be uh, fixated. Everything is changing. Like like regardless of what your uh, current configuration is, um, it will always have a positive rate to change to uh, the opposite uh, opinion. Um, so that's called positive rate. Um, so um, um, I think I'm kind of running low on time. Um, so this um, um, this uh, Larry Gray's result is actually, um, um, it's actually the, the best result people can obtain, uh, people obtain um, at this moment to uh, the very famous positive rate conjecture. Uh, but we're running on low on time, so I'm not going to spend any time on this, um, although the story is pretty fascinating. Um, um, but, but anyway, um, the, um, 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 one thing we, uh, one comment we want, I want to make today is um, um, that um, um, besides the nearest neighbor interaction case, not much is actually known about the majority vote processes on the, um, so, um, if the voting neighborhood uh, contains any non-nearest neighbor um, sites, um, this is actually not known. Um, okay. Um, and um, also not much is known for about the majority vote processes on general graphs or on higher dimensional lattices. Um, so um, only some scattering without. Um, so, so one result is um, due to uh, my advisor, Bramson, uh, and also Gray, uh, their drawn work at 19, uh, where they look at the, the D regular tree uh, with D greater than or equal to five. 
Um, and they also consider the majority of all processes um, on that tree with nearest neighbor interaction. And they prove that when epsilon is taken small enough, uh, regardless of the um, uh, the um, error distribution P0, uh, the majority vote processes is actually non-ergodic. Um, and they also find uncountably many invariant measures. Um, we also realize uh, this result. Um, so it turns out T4 is going to be the same, the four regular tree. Um, it's also non-ergodic with uncountable. T3, the, uh, the three regular tree. Um, 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 we actually show that it's also non ergodic However, we fail to find uncountably many invariant measures. Um, another work is um, also part of my thesis project. Um, um, is that um, uh, we actually show that when underlying graph is CD, uh, but we don't consider the nearest neighbor interaction. We only consider the one-sided uh, vote. Um, so this is the vote. Um, so instead of all the nearest neighbor, we're only looking at the nearest neighbor in the first, uh, uh, um, in the first uh, hyper -oc uh, hyper octant. Um, and we also show that the majority vote. Uh, process is non ergodic and we construct uncountably many invariant measures as well, regardless of the P0. <laughs> um, so a uh, intuitive look at um, why trees and uh, one-sided um, are um, ergodic. So all those are uh, inspired uh, by uh, Tom's work in um, cellular automata. Um, so basically, um, if you look at um, a finite cluster of one um, um, surrounded by all zero sides, uh, then you can find out either in the tree, um, so that's T3 on the left, or in the lattice case, um, so that's Z2. Um, um, you can find out that uh, the cluster of finitely many ones uh, won't be able to uh, resist the surrounding zero. Um, so they will be eaten up by zero gradually. Um, so it's gonna be the same uh, for the second case as well. Um, so, um, so, so you can imagine like if you start zero, um, the background, um, be, because the background is, is so strong, like regardless of how um, rare the noise band is, even if like all of a sudden there is a, uh, like a 10 million of uh, one pop up in the cluster, it will still be eaten up by the zero surrounding them gradually. So that's why it's gonna be ergodic. If you start with all zero, if you start with all one, um, they, um, um, the, the distribution are gonna be drastically different. If you start from all zero, the distribution will always be zero dominated. If you start with all one, it will always be one dominated. Um, so that's, This way of arguing on uh, this method um, fails for um, the um, nearest neighbor interaction majority vote processes. Um, because if you look at the same um, structure in day two, but this time we consider um, uh, the, um, the voting neighborhoods to be the four sides. Um, um, So for example, for this side, um, it's voting neighborhood. It's uh, no longer one-sided, but includes uh, those four sides. Um, then you will actually see a drastically different picture from before. Because now if we um, still look at this cluster of one um, without the play of noise, um, it, it will actually be able to hold up to itself. Um, so those one, if it's only majority vote, it's gonna like remain to be one um, forever. So um, so that's uh, the drastic difference between the behavior of um, this symmetric voting neighborhoods with previous um, uh, one-sided voting neighborhood. Uh, uh, but to, um, zero can be changed to one uh, because of- exactly. 
yes, right. So that perturbation, um, I, I didn't mention the perturbation. Of course, um, um, of course, like like this configuration will like um this cluster of one will it's not guaranteed to hold up to itself because of this random noise. What because one can be turned to zero. Um so so that's exactly um the, the challenging part. Um uh, is how to handle the perturbation. Uh, but here I just want to um like give a brief um um, um symmetric uh, voting neighborhood. Um but but yeah uh, of course, this doesn't mean this will be ergodic or, or anything else. Um, I, um, I'm not intended to say so. And also this question is still open. Like if we consider the, um, uh, the majority vote processes on day two with nearest neighbor interaction um, with a, a balanced noise, um, people still don't know whether it's ergodic or not. Okay. Um, um, so here, um, before we go into our result, um, I just want to quickly show you uh, a simulation uh, on day two. Um, so this is um, like, like we start with all zero configuration. We just count, um, excuse me. Um, we just count the, um, um, the number of spins that, uh, the number of vertices, uh, the number of sites that have opinion one. Um, so as you can see, um, um, of course, this is simulation, so it cannot be done on infinite space. Um, we use a periodic boundary condition on a large enough box. I think it's 100 times 100 in this case. Um, so as you can see from the simulation, it starts with all zero configuration. It gets pretty stable there. It's not a rigorously zero because of noise. And then all of a sudden, it um, there is a transition um, to all one configuration. And then uh, there are some um um some fluctuation there and then all of a sudden there is another transition back to all zero con uh, configuration um so this simulation is suggesting um um this simulation is suggesting um um the non ergodicity because those transition we're going to like like it's impossible to obtain in infinite space um It's a it's a very difficult question. Um, people fail to answer it for fifty years or so. Um. So, um, I should just speed up. Um. Result we're gonna um, um. So the result we're gonna show today is that, um, um, is that um, if we um still consider the uh, majority vote processes with nearest neighbor interaction. Um, um, but um, we don't consider the um, uh, the balanced noise case. We consider the unbalanced noise case. We show that it's not greater than zero. Um, um, if the noise is um, is very unbalanced. If the noise is um, like dominated by zero, um, or dominated by one, then um, then the majority vote processes um, will actually be ergodic. Excuse me, what does it mean, self-supporting graph? Um, right, I, um, I'm sorry, the, the, um, going through the definition will take a, a lot of time. So, so, um, um, so um, self-supporting graph is, uh, refers to uh, the structure like this. Like if you have uh, a, f a finite cluster that's able to hold up to itself uh, in fine in terms of graphs uh, this will be a self-supporting structure will be a structure um, 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 for every site for every vertex in that structure uh, the structure always contains at least half of the vote its voting neighborhood um, so if we think back in this case, um, um, uh, the voting, um, so, um, and if we look at this cluster, um, every, uh, every side has at least two, 
um, at least two um, neighbors in this cluster. So all those one will be able to hold up to itself uh, under the majority vote mechanism. Um, so we call this structure A to be uh, a self-supporting structure. And um, the condition we impose on that graph, uh, we term it as uniformly self-supporting. Um, so that condition says, um, is a condition requires that um, for every site in that graph X, uh, there always exists a, um, a self-supporting structure like that. And also we uh, require the self-supporting structure to be uniformly bounded as well. Um, so uh, we require it to be able to be covered by a ball of radius R0, where R0 is a constant. So if a graph together with the voting neighborhood um, satisfy these two conditions, uh, then it will be termed um, uh, to be uniformly self-supporting. And um, our result show, uh, our result is that uh, if we have a uniformly self-supporting uh, pair, a graph G with a voting neighborhood V, uh, then for every fixed value of noise, um, if, uh, if the noise, uh, if the error distribution is dominated by either zero or one, of course, um, by symmetry, um, then uh, the majority vote process is, is going to be um, um, ergodic, um, which means it admits a unique um, equilibrium. Um, we, we also have a convergence result. So result only work for the idea at the moment um, because it requires a finer computation. Um, on a lot of um, uh, graph structure. Um, so, so basically it's like, um, if it's on BD, um, assume all the previous conditions, um, then um, the majority vote processes, um, um, reg um, like um, re regardless of its initial distribution will converge exponentially fast to uh, this unique equilibrium. Um, so that's a similar result as we obtain uh, in uh, the one-sided. Uh, majority vote. Okay. Um, um, so um, I think I'm not going, to be going through the proof here. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe you have no time to. Right, right. And uh, um, you know, give everybody a uh, uh, entertaining. Um, actually, prepare this um, um, simulation um, that can kind of persuade you of why that result is valid. Um, so this is the uh, majority vote um, with unbalanced noise. And the noise is uh, favoring black, favoring uh, black is zero. And as you can see, um, so gradually, um, it, it starts with uh, a lot of white and gradually um, um, forms uh, those um, self-supporting structure of black. So as long as those are formed, uh, because the noise is favoring zero as well, so uh, it's actually going to form a pretty, uh, pretty good advantage over the zero, and um, gradually the whole space is going to be taken over by, uh, by the black. Um, so that's I, I think that that provides some intuition of why that result is valid. Um, now I would like to take any questions if you have. Thank you very much for interesting talk, and uh, we uh, have just one question, please. Yes. If okay, uh, okay. Uh, if uh, there are no any questions, uh, please. Uh, uh, then we thank you again, and we will switch to next talk. Right. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Mm -hmm. Next speaker is uh, Yuri Mialk uh, from uh, Odessa, Richelieu Lyceum, Lyceum. And uh, the title of the talk is Ehrenfest Model for Random, uh, uh, for Random Knots. Please. Yes. Uh, now we'll demonstrate my screen. Yeah. 
do you see the presentation? Yes. So let's begin. Uh, the theme of my talk is Ernfest model for random knots. Let's begin. Let's begin with definition of a knot. We will say that knot is a continuous embedding of the unit circle S1 into space R3. So here is the example of a knot, is a well-known trefoil knot. I will, uh, yeah, I can show it. So it's a, a famous, a well-known knot, trefoil knot. And uh, what we will study, we will study the uh, so-called diagrams of a knot. So every knot we can uh, describe by its projection on a plane with uh, such double points, uh, which is called crossings. And for each uh, crossing on that, we're showing which piece of a knot is going over the cross and which piece of a knot is going under the crossing. And that's the object that will will be. Uh, so at the knot, there are possible two types of crossing. Uh, which shown on which is shown on the picture, and uh, we will uh, describe the type of crossings by letter epsilon, which can be equal to plus or minus one. So now we are ready to formulate the Ehrenfest model for random knots. Suppose knot k has d crossings, and k is number from one to d minus one. At moments of time e equals one, two, and so on, we randomly change types of some k crossings. So as you can see on the picture, for a trefoil knot, at every moment of time, we change uh, type of some crossing. Uh, in our case, uh, for one crossing. And uh, we can describe all possible states of a knot by a set of vectors epsilon from uh, hypercube minus one, one to the power of D. Uh, in other words, we can describe all possible states of a knot K as set K from epsilon where epsilon is vectors from this hypercube. Uh, I want to mention that actually it occurs that it's very hard to say what knots will mostly appear during such random process. So we will answer more simpler question, uh, what behaviors will have Kaufman brackets of this? Uh, so let's define the Kaufman brackets. Uh, firstly, we will say that there are two ways of splitting and cross, uh, splitting and crossing. So the first one is like that, and the second one is like this. So the first one we split in a such way, and the second one in a horizontal line. Uh, and in second way, the new orientation can be chosen differently. There are uh, different of every crossing uh, by uh, plus minus one. So we can describe the splitting of all crossings of a node K by vectors u from hypercube minus one, one to the power of d. And then we can define uh, Kaufman brackets by its well-known state sum formula. We will say that Kaufman bracket of not to sum uh, for all vectors u, a to the power of alpha u minus beta u, and this factor to the power of gamma of from u minus one, where alpha u and beta u are numbers of first and second types of splitting respectively, and gamma u is the number of circles that we will get after we split all the crossings of a node k. And it occurs uh, such results. Firstly, there is direct formula for Kaufman bracket of a, a node. Uh, we have uh, our types of crossing uh, defined by epsilon vector. So for our vectors from our random we distribute it, then we have such formula for mathematical expectation of it. So to prove it, uh, first part is directly follows from the definition. So we just uh, simply check that our difference alpha from S minus beta S is equal to this sum. It's not that hard. And uh, for second part, we just need to notice that mathematical expectation of A to the such power is all of the terms of a, of a such product. A to the power of UI plus A to the power of minus UI divided by two. And the last thing that we need to notice is that uh, are actually all of these brackets are constants because U can be equal to plus or minus one. And these give us the same 
value. And uh, uh, now I want to mention that uh, this is the most accurate result that we can get for an arbitrary knot. So to know uh, some more accurate result, we need to know more about the knot that we are studying. So the, the reason that uh, next we have a family of torus knots. Torus knot uh, is a such knot that can be located on the surface of a torus. And it's a well-known fact that every torus knot can be defined by pair of co-prime integers PQ, where P and Q are numbers of times knot winds around its axis of rotational symmetry and around circle in the interior of the torus respectively. And as the example on the picture, uh, our, def our uh, previously shown trefoil knot is a torus 3-2 knot because it wraps three times around its axis of rotational symmetry and two times around the circle in the interior of the torus. And why we are uh, studying the torus knot? Because uh, torus knots have very useful property uh, with uh, its braid representation. So firstly, we need to, uh, we need to say what braid is. So we define a braid of M strands as a set of continuous function Z1 from T and so on ZM from T, uh, where ZI is a function on 0, 1 to uh, plane R square. And uh, this all set of these functions are does not intersect for all E does for all E does not equal to G and T from 0 to 1. There is a picture how it uh, will be looking if we have four strands. So our time and uh, some braids are is going something like this. And uh, we will be studying again it as a projection on a plane. So we will say that we have, if we have a projection, it's two parallel lines that one is t equals to zero, second one t equals one. We have uh, m points on both of them. And the strands are somehow uh, intersect, not intersects, but uh, behaving something like this. And uh, some more about the braids uh, that firstly, uh, suppose that BM is a set of isotopic classes of braids on M strand. Uh, and it's well known fact that BM is a group application defined as operation of connection of ending points of braids. So if we define a multiplication as we uh, take in one braid, the second braid and So the second, we will define this as a multiplication. Then BM is a group under multiplication. And uh, we will define closure of a braid as, as link obtained by connection of starting and ending points of braid as follows. Just closuring it like this. So why are I am telling all of this information to uh, formulate the result uh, for torus knots? Well, the fact that a torus PQ knot is a closure of a such breadth sigma 1, sigma 2, and so on, sigma P minus 1 to the power of Q, where sigma I is a such element that have M minus 2 parallel strands and uh, one such crossing. Uh, and we will use this fact to study our model for torus knots. Uh, but uh, accurately, we will be studying the torus 2Q knots. So torus 2Q two, uh, two knots will have such representation by this theorem. They will be have looking like this. And uh, we can formulate the result uh, for these knots. Uh, so if epsilon is uniformly distributed, then we have the probability of that this torus knots 2Q of epsilon is simplifies to torus knots 2M. And this probability equals to Q chose one half Q minus M divided by two to the power of Q. And so this is the interesting property that actually for this random process, our torus knots to Q are simplifies to its uh, simpler versions. Uh, to prove it, uh, we need to notice that if two adjacent crossings of this knot have different size, then they cancel each other. And it's um, it's well known a uh, second Redermeister move. Uh, notice that if uh, a torus took you 
for of epsilon has crossings with different types, then there is adjacent crossings of different times. And then we then we can cancel these crossings. And at the end, we will have only crossings of one type. Uh, so we can rewrite this probability as uh, probability that um, uh, sum uh, of epsilon i from y i uh, from one to q is equal to m. If there are left m uh, crossings of uh, is in the first case type plus one, and then this is a default probability uh, which is calculates uh, calculating is trivial. And in second case, if uh, there are not a plus, but a minus one crossing, this uh, so it's what it is. And uh, the next step that we will do is the research random braids, because this uh, uh, this idea uh, to study the knots through the braids, it became in this uh, theorem very useful. So we will try to study random braids. And first I will formulate the uh, Ayrton theorem, which says that our set of isotopic class of uh, braid on M strands is actually uh, that have generators sigma 1 with such relations. Uh, sigma 1 on sigma g is equal to sigma g on sigma i for uh, model i minus g bigger than or equal to 2. And the second one is Artin's relations that holds for uh, L from 1 to N minus 1. And uh, these theorems give us the random walk on the group BM. Suppose that C and R independent uniformly distributed on omega equals to sigma 1 and so sigma m, uh, sigma n to the minus 1 and so on, sigma m to the minus 1. Suppose that B1 is equal to C1 and Bn plus 1 is equal to Bn multiplied on Xn for n bigger than or equal to 1. And we will study such sequences of random braids. Let's define the length of random braid B, Bn uh, as a least number of crossings of all braids from isotopic class of Bn. And uh, denote n equals to model of Bn then occurs such a result for a length of random braids two strands. Uh, firstly, suppose that Sn is a standard random walk on of course Sn equals to sum uh, for e from 1 to n zeta e, where zeta e are independent identically distributed Bernoulli random variables. Then through such theorem that actually our length for two braids uh, length for braids with two strands is equal by the distribution to model of Sn. In other words, Ln have uh, such probabilities of transition. It's a, a random walk on the half line where at zero is located a reflection screen. Uh, to prove it, we need to just simply check that these two Markov chains have uh, the same uh, state spaces, uh, starting uh, probabilities, and the same uh, transition probabilities. Uh, so to check the first one, uh, we can say that L0 equals S0 equals 0. So at the moment before the start, uh, they have 0, both equal to 0. And uh, it's... Uh, as both of them are on uh, can equal to zero to so non-negative uh, whole numbers, uh, and they have the same state spaces. And then we know that they have the same transition probabilities, at and it's actually uh, not hard to check. Uh, we just need to notice the fact that if we have a random braid with two strands and we add a, some new element, sigma 1 or sigma 1 to the minus 1, then one of the elements will increase the length by 1, and the other one will decrease it by 1. So actually, this is the main argument why uh, Ln have the such behavior. So you can check that this uh, calculations is true, but I will save your time, and uh, we will go next. And so as we... Uh, 
uh, get this result, we can actually conclude uh, a low iterated logarithm for this uh, ln. So uh, we can say, because it's well known that for model Sn we have a low of iterated logarithm, so we can say that upper limit of ln divided by square root of 2n log log n is equal to 1 almost surely if n goes to infinity. Uh, and in conclusion, I want to uh, thank to my supervisor Andrei Anatolyevich Drogovsev for help uh, during our work. And uh, without him, this uh, my talk did not happen. So thank you for your attention. Is there any questions? Thank you. Uh, I only some call that uh, on last slides we see that uh, this uh, problem uh, of uh, the structure of uh, braid or torus knot uh, is closely related to loop uh, erasing random walk on some group. And uh, maybe Dean uh, Evgeny Borisovich was the first person who paid attention to such a walk in terms of uh, words. Uh, he discussed uh, the range of uh, random words where letters can cancel uh, one, uh, one uh, uh, some group of letters can cancel. Uh, uh, so uh, exactly the same we have here. And uh, uh, last year, uh, Yuri proposed some limit theorems for uh, Ehrenfest model when uh, uh, the number of the, uh, in our case here, crossings uh, uh, goes to infinity and no a number k uh, of crossings which we change for one time also goes to infinity. Uh, and we have some Hausian approximation. Uh, so uh, I think it can be uh, very interesting to see what happens with the uh, infinite knot, uh, what uh, Hausian structure will have in the limit and uh, what occurs in the limit. But uh, I, I, I suppose that Yuri will say something next year. Um, may I uh, say one okay. remark? Maybe uh, uh, you have to look at the works of Malyshev. He considered some strings of letters that may be non... Uh, uh, they, they also cancel each other, but say three may be canceled or four or in some, uh, letters in some order. And it seems to me that he had some mark of structure for writing these words one uh, letters one by one. So it may be close to... to to not that that possible. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, I did. Uh, Ma Malishev call, call his did. system like string. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good, uh, Mark. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, now we finish all our. Uh, talks for today and uh, I'm uh, for me it was uh, very interesting all talks were very interesting even I prepared uh, half of liter cup of coffee uh, but uh, everything okay without it yeah uh, so uh, let me uh, congratulate again our speakers and send all of them uh, and I must say that we will prepare uh, some certificates about this conference and uh, a, a, every participant will get such certificate by, uh, via email. Uh, uh, now we close uh, our scorecard readings and as I said it's the beginning. Uh, we have a seminar next week uh, with Professor Hany Hajayev talk. Uh, thanks everybody and bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Yes. Thank you.